Hello everyone, and as Viam, who's on camera with me today, pulls focus from the acacia thorns to the plated lizard, we would like to welcome you on this live safari. This is a creature we do not get to show you very often, so it's a bonus, a great way to start off the afternoon, and it is called a giant plated lizard. I guess it's not really a giant, it's probably only 10 inches from the tip of its toe to the tip of its tail, but it is a big lizard, no doubts. And I think it's probably out trying to bask in whatever little bits of sunlight or warmth may be permeating through this cloudy weather that we're experiencing. It's about 25 degrees Celsius, 77 degrees Fahrenheit. My name is Scott, and like I said, I'm teamed up with VM on camera. James is out on the other vehicle. He's with Brian, and you're gonna be heading across to him now. We're in an area that we're about to lose signal in, and we don't want to delay. We are on the search for the Incohoma Pride of Lion and a couple of the Birmingham males. Tracks of theirs indicated that they came onto Juma last night, but because of a heavy downpour of rain we got early this morning, a lot of those tracks have been washed away. Anyway, James is also coming into this area. We're both gonna search and we will now be sending you across onto his vehicle as we go through a low signal area. Wish us luck and we'll see you shortly. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, a cloudy game drive in the northeast corner of South Africa. Scott has welcomed you with a lizard. I was going to welcome you with a bee eater, which has subsequently absconded, and therefore I welcome you with the sight of a dead knobthorn tree staring up into a gunmetal grey sky. My name is James Hendry, and it is quite a somber afternoon, given the fact that there is this sky, but we're actually quite pleased for it. It has been a beastly hot summer, as many of you regular watchers will know. Now, I would like to know from you how you feel about this weather. Does it make you feel somber? Does it make you feel full of joy? Does it make you feel, I don't know how it might make you feel, but I would like to know, so tell us. Hashtag Safari Live if you happen to be tweet tweeting, or questions at wildearth.tv if you're on the email. Otherwise, get hold of us on YouTube if you're watching on YouTube with the YouTube chat. This this is a mechanism of communication that is beyond the realms of my understanding. Many of you, however, are more social media savvy than I am. Now, our plan is to go and help Scott to try and find those lions. We don't know where the tracks went. The tracks obviously crossed before that shower of rain we had this morning. So they left their mark on the road, disappeared into the block, and we didn't see them again. So with any luck, we'll be able to pick them up. On camera today is Brian Joubert. That's his thumb there. Uh, decorated, as you can see, spectacularly. Well done, Brian. Mm, thank you. Very thank nice, you. very nice uh, thumb design today. And um, my name is James, for those of you who don't know. And if you didn't know, well, that's not a problem at all. Here we go. Brian, there's nothing left on that dead knob thorn. It's no. on its own. Now, Heidi, you are obviously somebody who's not very demanding at all, easy-going human being, and you say that uh, for the first hour you would like lions, elephants, and leopards. Not demanding at all, you have to leave after 60 minutes or so. Uh, I will do my best to find a leopard, a, an elephant, possibly some elephants, and a lion for you to look at before you have to go and do whatever it is that you have to do. I can't believe there's anything in the world more important than watching what we're doing out here. But, you know, some people have different priorities, I suppose, Heidi. There, Brian, that'll be easier. Now you can see me. Is that, is that better? Yes. I can now feel my sternum crushed up against the, uh, the front of this uh, steering wheel here. Now we're driving through the middle of the reserve and we had a very small shower this morning, probably about five or six millimeters, so not much. Uh, that's about, hmm, about a fifth of an inch. Toto Pod. Um, the <laughs> the way this weather makes you feel is almost as um, odd as your Twitter handle, Toto Pod. You say this weather makes you feel bletchy. I, I don't know what that means. Do you know what that means? 
No. Toto, Pod, please tell us what you mean. I, I mean, I, I think I, I think I also feel the same about this weather. I, it, it sounds like I might feel. Blechy, bleachy, blechy maybe. Not so good. That's how um, it normally makes me feel, unless it's been at the back end of a low felt summer, in which case it makes me feel deeply happy and grateful for the shade, the coof, the fact that I may have to don a jacket, and the knowledge that when I lie my head finally down to sleep tonight, it will not be on the sweaty sheets, but indeed I will be covered with a light duvet. And Sharon, you say cloudy days make you feel introspective. I feel exactly the same, you know. I was walking back to the camp today. Um, I'm not sure where I was walking from, actually. And I suddenly felt quite introspective. Uh, almost sad, not quite sad, but certainly a, a sense of um, uh, mm, slight heaviness, I suppose. Luckily, that has lifted from me, and now I am my normal, joyful self as we drive through the wilderness trying to discover new things. Bless you, Brian. Bless you, Brian. Bless you again, Brian. That's the last time. Brian does get a little bit hay fevery. Especially if there's been a bit of wind. Now, Scott was not far from here where he lost signal, and he went up that way. We're going to sort of crisscross where he's been and go and follow up in the same sort of area. Diane, you say that there are alarm calls coming from Juma. Um, Diane, how do you know? Is the camera back up and working? I don't, I don't even know. Okay, right, so some kind of alarm calling guinea fowl around Juma. Well, we'll keep an eye out. I know that Aubrey and Tax are going out this afternoon. They haven't left yet. So if there is something around there, they will be around to have a look. This is where we saw, I don't know if any of you were with us, that donkey-sized waterbuck the other day. Looked like a small donkey that had escaped from the local community, but in fact it was a waterbuck. It was right around here, and I haven't seen it here, and I haven't seen it again. And I hope the little fellow has survived, perhaps rejoined his family. The tiniest waterbuck I'd ever seen. So Scott went up that way. We're now going to go through the middle here, sort of crisscross where he's been. We think the lions are somewhere in that fairly vast expanse of woodland over there. If any luck, we'll be able to find them. Certainly their tracks. <laughs> Regina, you say you're in southwest Pennsylvania where the sun never shines, it's always cloudy, and you say you're always somber as a result. I'm sorry about that, Regina. I'm sorry to have brought you more somberness uh, with our weather. But unfortunately, it is not within my power to bring back the sun. It will apparently return with a vengeance during the course of next week. So fear not, Regina. Your African rays of sunshine to cheer you up will be highing to you in high definition, uh, probably from about Monday. Now, we just need to keep an eye on the road to make sure that those lions didn't come wandering across the road here sometime during the course of the morning. It has been a cool day, and as many of you will know, the lions will move on a cool day like this. Well, not always, but they can. They certainly wouldn't be averse to hunting, and the last cool day that we had those lions on, they were killing a zebra, which um, would be very exciting if they do the same. Fiona and Genevieve, you 
say you are very pleased about for the weather. Um, you're grateful for the shade that it is giving us. And you say bring on the insects, the arachnids, and the mushrooms. Oh, we'll see if we can find some mushrooms for you. Certainly, the end we have any more moisture, any more rain, we'll get a couple more dung beetles and a lot more termites emerging, and that will in turn bring out the arachnids. Let's head across to Scott. He's got some insect-eating birds to show you. Well, this is a bird that we don't very often get to show you good views of, so we thought we'd bank this opportunity. It is a European bee-eater. Some of you who were on the Sunset Safari yesterday would remember seeing flashes of them flying past in the sighting with the lesser spotted eagle feeding on the reproductive termites that were emerging. Oh, and off it goes. Great agility on the camera there, Viam. Didn't miss a thing. So, we are just passing the Buffalo Zook waterhole, which is just behind us. And I'm going to head back onto our northern boundary just to check very carefully to see if I didn't miss any tracks or signs of these lines that we were tracking this morning, or at least attempting to. They didn't, in fact, cross out of our property. We I'm not sure what's going on. I just got a report from Ephraim saying that he saw a male lion track crossing. Um, but I fear that he may have been confused with the baby hippopotamus track. That also initially confused me when I initially saw the track. I was like, oh no. There go the lion into Buffalo or Quartzhall. But on closer inspection, we did actually work out that it was a tiny baby hippo with tracks about the perfect size to resemble that of a male lion. But now I'm doubting myself and whether I may have missed an actual lion track. So we're going to head back and check what's going on. There's a few very fine drops of drizzle falling on us. So it's a bit of a catch-22. Of course, we want the rain desperately for this ecosystem, which is incredibly parched at the moment. But it does mean it will make our safari a little bit difficult and possibly have to call it off if it does get too heavy. But it's too soon to panic. Hello to Virginia. And you would like to know if there have been ever any further sightings of that elephant car that we saw with the hugely swollen belly. There was even thoughts that we may have even seen that little baby kicking within her belly. But no, sadly, Virginia, no further sign of her. The tricky thing with elephants is that they're not territorial. So unlike animals like Karula or the Inkohuma lioness, it's very difficult to keep track of animals like elephants. So I guess that's a great pity. It would be wonderful if we could get to know them as well as we get to know some of the other stars of the African wilderness, but they don't have territories or home ranges. They are free-roaming nomadic creatures. Interesting. We've got some feedback regarding James's question asking you guys about how you feel about this overcast weather. And Diane's mentioned if she was here experiencing this weather, it would put her in a good mood. No ways. What have you spotted, VM? Where's it? Um. Oh, can you believe it? You are a legend, VM, and this is just the most awesome. Oh, no, don't be a runner. It could be Kojima. It could be a male that we've never seen before. It is a male. Well spotted, VM. We're on Buffalzook Dam East Road, and he's heading down in towards the drainage. He doesn't look comfortable with vehicles. It could be the same leopard that was seen 
by Brent just the other day. It doesn't look like the biggest of males to me. I'm just going to give him a moment to kind of try and get a little bit used to us rather than giving, putting huge pressure on him, but we do want to try and keep an eye on him. Obviously, well done, Viv. That was an epic spot. Yo! Can you believe it? Now, I don't think we must put too much pressure on this leopard. Um, so I'm not going to ask James to come rushing into this area. It, it's, it's not going to be... It's hugely useful, I don't think. Um, but we will try from a distance just to let him know that we come in peace. We don't want to give him a hard time. Can you see him moving through the VM at about 10 o'clock? He just o'clock? lied down. Did he? Yes. Perfect. He just lay down right behind that log. I see spots a little bit. Can you see a few spots there? I can't. If we could view him from a distance, it would be first prize. Um, and that way we could slowly kind of try and reassure him that we are not here to harm him. And this is wonderful to, uh, behavior to, to witness because many of you would never have seen how a leopard will naturally act in the wild if they are not habituated to vehicles. So I'm just going to... Okay, now we've got a view of him here, VM. It's not going to be great, but I can see him, and that's all we want, is just to keep an eye on him from a distance. If you just zoom in there, I'll direct you to him. You'll find him, and then there we go, spot on. You've got him just up a bit, and you're on him. So, we're just going to keep this view. Um, I know it's not great. I know it's nothing like the views some of you guys have shared with us with the various leopard that we see on a regular basis. But this is how you habituate them, one example of how. Keeping an eye from a distance where they feel comfortable. And you can see, he's watching us. And it's been over a week since we've seen a leopard, so this is a very, very pleasant surprise. Searching for lion, finding leopard. That is the joy of being on a live safari. You simply do not know what is going to happen and when. Now, because we had such a brief view of him, I can't tell exactly how old or young or too much about him, but hopefully that will change. as the afternoon unfolds. No, why now? Why? Look at the way he's keeping it on us. This is so awesome. And this is how leopards can act and will act in normal circumstances when they are naturally shy and elusive. Just gonna VM. Oh, well done, VM. Good call. He's just popped out into another gap there. Straight in front of us. A few more decent views. He looks like a decent sized male, but not a not a brute. He's not an old big male. Oh, here comes a scent mark. So that's interesting. Oh, now we're getting some good views. He does have a bit of a dewlap on him. His belly looks fairly full. And this is awesome. This is a new leopard for everyone involved on Safari Live. Who knows who exactly he could be? But who knows what I should do? I think 
Mackie is going to keep following the small drainage line or riverbed. So I just want to try and slither us into a decent spot where we may be able to get one or two more views of him. He doesn't look old to me. I'd peg him at about a four or five year old male coming into his prime. squirrel alarm calling wildly behind us. Here he comes, Liam. 10 o'clock. Look at this. This is too good. Please take lots of screenshots. He's a beautiful male. And we might be able to work out where he's come from or who he is. This is great. He seems to have already relaxed quite a lot. And he's about to pop out into the open. Look at this. Very pale eyes. A distinctive notch in his right ear. That's a very clear characteristic. It looks like he's got a very clear spot pattern as well. Doesn't feel comfortable out in the open. But he's not a big old male, and that'll explain why he is here. Here comes the scent mark. This is great. You can make your home here. But I don't know if you promise us to become a little bit more relaxed, which I'm sure he will. Over time, we can gently persuade him that we are not bad people and that he has no f need to fear us. Not that he does think we are bad, it's just that this is how leopards naturally act. They are naturally shy, naturally elusive. Going to Watson Road. Cross the road. Okay. He has crossed. Yeah. Watch this branch behind us here. Ben. Hold tight, everyone. We're going to have to do some fast. Howdy, you said he may be Macombo, a young male leopard from other years. Um, Macombo is completely relaxed with the vehicles. So that is why I think he is a different male. He could have come from the Manualeti Reserve or Oh, we picked up a little passenger. <laughs> so, I've just seen him there, he's straight ahead of us. I just saw the white tip of his tail. He's crossed over this road. Now, I'm not going to call the sighting in because it's just going to create unnecessary pressure on this leopard and we're just going to keep this little secret to ourselves. better chance of trying to get him relaxed with the vehicles. But it is not going to be easy. This bush he's moving into is quite thick now. And I'm almost inclined to maybe just try and get one more view and not push the, push the boundaries too much and not put too much pressure on him. I think we should maybe actually bank this as the last possible view through there. Ah. He just disappeared. Ah. Um. We'll definitely call it in over the radio once we are done, like I said, so it's not going to be a complete secret from the other guides, but as you can see, we've got enough on our plate now just trying to stay with them. We're not going to be able to stay with them any further here. Not on this side of the riverbed that he crossed through onto. So let's see if we can't just coast along a little bit. We may get another view, but I'm going to be content not to try too hard because Hopefully over time he will, if we treat him nicely, he may do the same thing.
Dallas and Ohio, no, this is definitely not communal quarantine. This behavior is indicative of a leopard that has not grown up being exposed to humans and or vehicles. He has come from a remote part of the Krugel, perhaps an area where, like I say, not many seasoned safari goers will be and therefore the animals do not get gently habituated. I think we should call it quits, everyone. As you can see, the bush is very thick. And we've had good sightings. You can see he, he was uncomfortable with us, but we did get some awesome moments. He, he did walk very close to the vehicle, much closer than I thought he would. There a big open area where he got a little bit nervous and ran off, but that was absolutely wonderful. To see a leopard respond to us like that really gets my heart racing. Just gonna get on the game drive radio now. Uh, and VM, well done again. There are many hundreds of people who are praising Sorry, your spotting you skills. Me, and a new leopard um, is something that we don't get very often. So that's awesome. And he could be setting up shop here, which is interesting because he could well then have to come up against Tingana dominant male who pushes up against him and this is the old territory of Mvula so I guess it also uh, indicates that Mvula really is making space for younger blood to come through. Stations had a brief glimpse of a nervous Maroda Ingwe on Bufflesuk Dam East. He headed east quite close to the Bufflesuk firebreak. Uh, didn't attempt to follow. Afternoon, Scotty, thank you. For the record, he had a distinctive kind of little notch missing off his right ear. That was all I could really see. Wonderful. That was so cool. We got some great shots of him. So again, not only well done to VM for spotting that animal, but to also, or for also being able to bring you guys such great images and what was a very, very exciting moment for us all. So thankfully we managed to remain mildly composed. Yeah, I'll put him as a young male. That's, you know, just like uh, Quarantine and Kunyuma have moved out of our area. Two young males that grew up here. They were born to Karula, the female leopard of this area. Just like they moved off, as will all young males. They'll move out of their natal territory and then start looking for a property of their own. And... That'll happen anywhere from about three years of age to, well, until they find it, a territory of their own, which could take up to about five to six years of age when they'll start doing that. So let me know your thoughts, any of the leopard experts amongst us. I'd be interested to hear what you think. You're in luck. I know you did ask James that you want lion, leopard, and elephants all within the first hour of drive because that's the only amount of time you can allocate to us. And at least we got you one out of those three. And more importantly, I'm a firm believer in quality sightings over quantity in terms of length of time of sightings. And that right there was an absolutely epic, high quality leopard sighting of a different nature, but to see a leopard respond like that to us is something that I haven't seen for a long time and something that many of you would never have seen. And you can just imagine what it's like to be on the opposite end of an animal that is that sneaky and sly and has the ability to dissolve into the, the thickets like it did. 
And like I often say to you, uh, to, uh, to you uh, some of, sometimes people are worried about the, the way we off-road after leopards and as if they don't have the ability to escape if they didn't want to. But they do, and that was clearly evidence in the way that leopard just responded to our behavior, or to us at least. Wunderbar. I'm going to drive along in the general direction that he was moving in. He could pop out anywhere, and we're going to send you across to James with some zebra. Now, there's some zebra there up ahead on the road, and uh, while I, that's a fairly obvious statement, just a quick comment, wonderful to see a new leopard, and I think very interesting that that leopard, possibly the same one Brent saw a few days ago, and quite possibly heading into the territory of Mvula. Mvula getting past the age where he's gonna be able to defend himself against a young buck like that. Are we witnessing the end of his reign? Time will tell, keep tuned to find out. Now, when we came along here, these zebra came herring out of the block here. They were running at a great speed down the road, and they're now staring into the bush where I thought maybe the lions might be, but I thought maybe they now were running from the lions. I see no tracks at the moment. We're gonna drive slowly down here. We'll do a loop around and then a sort of figure of eight motion, I think, if that's okay with you. Brian, is that okay with you? It's fine with me. Oh, thank goodness. Right, here we go. I don't think they're heading into where there would be lions, but they really did come rushing out of this block. But they weren't alarming, which indicates to me that they weren't in imminent danger. And for those of you who don't know what a zebra alarm calls, sounds like, uh, Brian, would you like to demonstrate it? I think you're better, better Are you sure? Me. Yeah. Okay. A zebra goes like this, everybody. I won't be able to look you in the eye while I do this because it's ridiculous. They go. See, look, they're watching. Ciao. Now, just look Ciao. through the woodland here. These guys look pretty chilled out now, but they certainly weren't when we saw them. So we go, we'll go around the other side of the block there, just see if those lions perhaps aren't that side. We haven't seen them crossing out of the reserve. I did chat to Taxon earlier. He re his tracker reckoned that the tracks were probably from last night, early last night. So, you know, they could have gone quite far. See them melting into the strychnos thicket here. It's a black monkey thorn thicket. And this particular part of the reserve is covered in these black monkey thorns. And I think Black monkey orange, sorry, black monkey oranges. I think it's quite indicative that although a lot of people will tell you there are too many elephants around, I think this species is a real indicator that there perhaps aren't enough elephants around. It's certainly encroaching. You can see as we drive through here that it kind of grows in these monospecific stands. In other words, it grows on its own with not much around it. You are obviously not a new viewer because you know that we have a sausage tree here. Now, everybody, Wolfgang would like to see the sausage tree and its progress and how it's doing at the moment. Uh, Wolfgang, the sausage tree, sadly, we can take you past it, has produced no flowers and no fruits, therefore, this year. I'm not sure if that particular sausage tree ever did, but I'm going to assume that it did, and I think that's probably purely because of a lack of water this year. So the sausage tree has produced nothing. Now, for those of you who don't know what a sausage tree is, it's a tree whose botanical name is Kegelia africana, and it makes these giant pods like that, sort of like an enormous knockwurst, if you like. And they're very hard and very heavy, and you can make cosmetics out of the sort of cream inside them, but they're not particularly edible. In fact, they're not edible at all. It tastes very nice. They also make gorgeous yellow, or not yellow, red flowers, which are pollinated by bats and orioles.
Thank you, D. Oh, may you say that my, um, my call of the zebra was excellent. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Now, that call, of course, gives rise to the common Afrikaans name, which is Kwaha. It's an onomatopoeic name because apparently it's saying Kwaha, 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 Kwaha. I've never heard a zebra say the sound <laughs> Have you? No. no, no. Not lately, anyway. Not lately, no. Anthony James here on YouTube, and just before I address your question, we've got a very interesting little reptile here. And he doesn't want to be seen. This is a fascinating one. He's the le um, the less common tortoise species that we get here. He's called a speaks hinged tortoise. And I want to show you his hinge. I'm not going to pick him up. Can you see over there, Brian? Can you see that? Yep. Where my stick is. Just there, there's a hinge. And what he does is he closes his carapace in on his back legs. And that just makes him even safer than a leopard tortoise would be. A leopard tortoise has a completely solid carapace, but these hinge tortoises have got a little hinge there, so he's able to pull that area there straight in under his back legs, which I think is the most amazing adaptation. Isn't he lovely? He was moving quite a speed across the road. We're lucky we saw him. All right, on you go. Sorry to disturb you. He will be in search of things, believe it or not, like the giant land snail. He's not a completely herbivorous reptile, that one. And while the little leopard tortoise will wander around the place eating fresh shoots and leaves, the speaks hinge tortoise can be quite carnivorous. They also eat pill millipedes if you can believe it. Delicious pill millipedes. Mm. I'm being facetious, of course. There he goes. And you can see, those of you who have been watching for a while, you can tell that, that he's a much flatter species than the other one and much less conspicuously colored. And it's an interesting one. We were asked yesterday why it is that a leopard tortoise should have those black and gold colors, which seemingly make it more obvious. And I think it probably is because the leopard tortoise lives in a slightly different habitat. You'll probably find that this tortoise lives out in more open areas like this, where the leopard tortoise will hang around in the shade of bushes more than the speaks hinged tortoise would, I would say. Anyway. Now, Anthony James, you say you're a new viewer, you're on YouTube, and you say, okay, cool, but how do I make this as a job? And you say, how do you get into it? Uh, because you do love animals. Well, a prerequisite for a love for animals is, is certainly, a, I'd say it's a first step, Anthony James. Uh, the next thing to do would be to try and get some form of guiding qualification, just so that you can familiarize yourself with not only the animals, but the trees and the birds and the soils and the grasses and the general picture of the ecology that goes on in an area like this. And then I suppose, uh, well, we're the only people in the world that do this, you know. We're the only people in the world taking live safaris, certainly on a daily basis. One or two others have tried. I think there was one on Good Morning America the other day, uh, which was one woman standing in the back of the back the same thing at all. We all got very worried that enormous competition was, was coming. We weren't particularly terrified when we saw the result, though. So kind of apply to us, Anthony. Well, not me. That's be well beyond my pay grade. But anyway, that's how you did. So, Anthony, I don't know if you missed any of that. We did lose a little bit of audio. The other thing, of course, you need is this is not... It's quite interesting. People say, well, you know, you've got a, such a lovely conservation job. It must be beautiful being in the it is. That's exactly one of the reasons that I'm out here. But this is not a conservation job. It's far more a presenting job than it is a conservation job. And if you don't enjoy the look of 3,000 people barreling down on your face through the camera,
um, which some people don't and some people absolutely love, it's a very difficult job for you to do. Beautiful bird, a cape glossy starling. Isn't that lovely? Look at the color juxtaposed with that sort of golden green. Isn't that stunning? And that's bright, l'orange eye. I think that's just beautiful. I actually think it's a greater blue-eared glossy starling. I don't think it's a Cape Glossy. Okay, as soon as we move in this area, everybody, you're going to lose our signal. So let's head back across to Scott, see what he has to show you. We're going to do a sort of figure of eight loop around and see if we can't pick up tracks of those lions. See you shortly. So, no major updates here. I'm not too sure what to suggest regarding these lion and all their lack of tracks. It makes it difficult to guess where they've been. I must admit, though, I did miss one track. The track that I accused Ephraim of thinking was a baby hippo was, in fact, a male lion. Whether the rest of the Inkuma pride crossed with that male lion, but nearly their tracks were washed away by the rain, I'm not sure. Um, but it doesn't matter, as we've learned just a few moments ago, even though we may be looking for lion, not really knowing where they are, you can bump into anything else along the way. Hello, doodles. And good to have you with us. You've just mentioned how much you enjoyed having this sighting of a new male leopard because it's made you appreciate and understand just how lucky we are with the habituated leopards of this area. And you're entirely correct, and it's something we probably don't hammer home enough to you guys, is that the Sabi Sands is one of the best places in Africa to see leopard. There are many other places in Africa where you can see leopard that are habituated, but this is definitely one of the best spots. So we must remember that and not take that for granted. And judging by his behavior, you can see and imagine just how tricky it would become if we didn't have a seasoned veteran like Vim on the back, we would never have spotted that leopard. So yeah, we must appreciate the habituated animals and also just remember that it's not only leopard that require habituation. If you are to go into remote parts of Africa, which there are many uh, parts of Africa which are incredibly remote, where people will hardly come into contact with animals and vice versa, there, lions, elephants, rhinos, buffalo, you name it, every wild animal that sees a human or a vehicle for the first, second or third time will run away from it. They'll say, hang on, I'm not interested in this and I'm getting out of here. And it takes a long time of gentle persuasion and habituation to make animals understand that we are not actually a threat to them. So I guess we owe a lot to people who had been coming to this reserve, for example, from the 1960s, armed with only cameras and maybe video or video cameras and photograph cameras trying to capture and document these animals. There's a big mud wallow that's filled up. And that's going to be making our lives and finding animals difficult until they dry up again. Well, hopefully they won't. Hopefully we continue to get rain as we should in the summer months. You can see there's been an algae bloom. But this is certainly not going to mean that the waterholes are not going to be as productive. The Juma waterhole camera is not going to be getting as many customers as it has been. But that is good. It is typical of a rainy summer in the low fault. The dry months are when we rely in the winters, when we generally rely on better waterhole viewing. Tammy and Paul, 
You guys are both interested to know my thoughts on this, what looked to me like a young male leopard and why he would have moved out of his territory in the first place and what's Tangana going to do? Well, um, ooh, spotted VM is possibly the one who should have been driving today. He just spotted that, that lilac breasted Arola. Very pretty bird that would have been great to view from its perch, which was very nearby, but I missed it. Well done, Liam. Um, so, firstly, um, I don't think he's ever had his own territory. He, like most young male leopards, up to the age of about two to three, will lurk in their mother's territory or their father's territory, and they'll be tolerated within their mother's and their father's territory because they're their children, but only up to a point. I guess no different to the way humans should be treated. You know, you get nurtured up to a point, and then once you're big enough to look after yourself, you must get kicked out of the house and start fending for yourself. No more pocket money, etc. And it's the same with leopard. Uh, from about three years of age, they will be told to head out into the big wide world, just as we would, and start fending for themselves. And what will typically happen is that between three years and five to six years of age, they're gonna be flying below the radar lurking in dominant males' territories uh, and just, you know, fine-tuning their hunting skills, getting bigger. They're not nearly big enough uh, to take on uh, males uh, who would be dominant at around six or seven years of age when they are half that age. So I think he's getting to that point now where, you know, he's found this little corner where there's maybe not too much leopard activity. Tangana we don't see here too much. And Vula seems to move away. So maybe there's been a bit of a vacuum that he's been able to move into um, without too much other leopard density here, or at least male leopard density. But he is getting to that size and age again. This is just my theory where he will be able to start actively competing against the bigger males. But that takes time and he's just going through that kind of natural progression of getting there. It's not an instantaneous one day you are relying on mom, one day you're a big dominant male. He's just going through the motions, not quite there yet. He didn't have a big dewlap. He's still got some growing to do, I thought. Jennifer, you are thinking very uh, smoothly here, and I like the way your head is working. You've said if he hangs around you and he spends some time with the habituated leopard, won't that help uh, us uh, habituate him faster? And yes, it most certainly will. But leopards are solitary, so how is that going to work when they are mating? And it's interesting, I've seen uh, female leopard who wasn't habituated before. She was a nightmare. Um, she occupied a territory right slap bang in the center of a property where I used to work in the southern Sabi Sands. And she would not let you see her. Even if you found a drag mark where uh, she would have dragged her kill that she's made across a road, follow, 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 find the kill up in the tree. You wouldn't even get a glimpse of her running away from that kill or even see her around the kill. Before you even got there, she would have disappeared. And the only time that we start to, started to see her was when she was mating, because uh, we would be able to follow two sets of tracks, not one. And the male, once we found him and her, she may run off, but he would stay there. And as you guys would have noticed, it's the leopardess that have to do the work with the males. So um, she would come out of her hiding place and then do her little leopard lap dance to try and seduce him. And as he would start to mount her, she would move closer to bushes. So she would keep kind of luring him by with these lap dances until such point that they were disclosed in the bushes and then they could mate. But it is a good example of how when a habituated leopard and unhabituated leopard join up, which is basically only when they're mating, you will have opportunities to spend more time with them. And it is, it's just about spending more time with them that slowly and surely you will hopefully get them habituated. There's no guarantees though. Um, you know, all leopard are different and some may be naturally more relaxed with people than others. I guess Kunyuma and Quarantino are a good example of that. Two brothers who were exposed to 
all of the same behavior, yet one was far more relaxed with the vehicles and our presence than the other. Good stuff. I'm not too sure where to go next, so while we try and work that out, we're going to send you across to James. <clears throat> well, I have to confess I'm in the same boat as Scott. I'm not really sure what to do next after this either. We're driving along Ledwood Road. The zebras look like they were running from a position just in front of us. So with any luck, there'll be a pride of lions lying on the ground there. Otherwise, I think we'll probably abscond and go somewhere else. They could well have walked off the property sometime during the course of that rain or just before it, and we wouldn't have seen their tracks going anywhere. Is deeply irksome. Anyway, that is just the way of things. Mm. Now, Stacy, you are Eric Moore's husband. Uh, hello, Eric. Hello, Stacy. And Stacy, you, Eric, of course, is a very sorry. Yes, Eric is Stacy's husband. That's correct, not uh, the other way around. Okay, good. Now, Stacy, you want to know about leopards, and if they were injured, would we think about helping them, or would we just let them be? Um, Stacy, it would depend on the nature of the injury. If they, we thought that they were injured, there's a kudu over there, exactly where I thought the lions were going to be lying. There's lots of kudu here. If, they, if we thought, Stacy, that the leopard had been injured by a human being or by some kind of anthropogenic effect, so perhaps a snare from a poacher or perhaps a, I don't know, got caught in a camp or something like that, then we would definitely do something about it. Brian, we've got no picture. Uh, we're back now. Um, definitely do something about it, but if we just found a leopard limping along the place, then we wouldn't do anything about it at all. What we would do is uh, probably just let things take their course. We try and have as little effect on the wilderness out here as possible, but obviously that is not always possible. Um, I think with something like an endangered species, like a wild dog or a cheetah, or something like that, we'd probably get involved. That said, that's the official policy on things. I think you'd find that if we found a leopard with a serious gash on it, say it had run through a bush and torn, really torn some muscle quite badly and looked like it was going to die, I'd say it would be about a 50-50 chance as to whether the Sabi Sands, which is the conservation authority in this area, would try and help the leopard or just let it pass into the night, as it were. Now, these are two magnificent male kudu, bulls, as we call them, and they are I think, just truly spectacular. It's no wonder to me that they are the emblem of the South African National Parks. Not only are they very beautiful, but they occur in just about every habitat type that we have here in South Africa, save for straight grassland and pure forest. So they occur in the dry regions of the Karoo, up into the Northern Cape in the Kalahari Desert, and they occur all the way out here in the far eastern reaches of what is, I think, the most beautiful country on planet Earth. Mm. Now, Jack, you are in Romania. That is very nice. I'm not sure we've heard from you, Jack, before. And Jack, Romania, obviously not a place where you do too much in the way of safari. But, Jack, you want to know what time is the best time of the day to go on safari, to look for animals? Jack, pretty much when we do it, you know, first uh, early morning and then as we go into the evening. Most of the animals out here are what we call crepuscular. Now, what that means is that they are active around about dawn and around about dusk. At this time of the year, it's normally very hot during the middle of the day and very few animals will do anything. And then at night, of course, it's always not, well, it's not a bad idea to be out at night, but you do have to have very specialized equipment in order to see everything that there might be around during the course of the night time. So nice one, Jack. Thank you. Is this the first time you've spoken to us from Romania? It would be very nice to know if this was your first time and 
wonderful that someone all the way from Romania is watching us. And we were discussing capital cities today in camp. I'll put this question through to the final control. What is the capital of Romania, Leanne and Nicola? A very slight scotch mist blowing in, so a bit of sort of soft, gentle moisture coming out of the air. I say scotch mist, it's not very scotch at all. Scotch mist, would, of course, would be accompanied by probably a very strong wind. I think Nicola just used Google to help her there. The capital of Romania, of course, is Brian Bucharest. Indeed, she has just admitted that she used googly. She googlyed it, Brian, she googlyed it. Mm -hmm. Just gonna look carefully underneath the bushes here. Hello, Kruger guy. You live in the United Kingdom, you say, and you use Safari Live to increase your learning. Well, that's a good thing, I suppose. I'm, I'm glad we're able to add a little bit to your knowledge. And please don't forget to ask us questions if you want to. Anything specific, it doesn't have to be about what we're looking at. It can be anything about South Africa or Africa, if, if you like. And we will do our level best to give you a first-hand account of whatever it is that you want to know about. You say that on your Good Morning America show, where they did that live safari in Kenya, the guide there said that a hippopotamus is able to control his buoyancy through air in the gut. Now, we, you say well, you've been taught through Safari Live that hippos cannot float, that they sink to the bottom of the ground. I think what you'll find, Marianne, is that they don't float like you and I will float, and I don't think it matters too much how much air they have in their guts and how much they don't. What they do, though, is change the buoyancy. Now, buoyancy doesn't necessarily mean floating. So if you watch a hippo in very deep water or deepish water, they will walk along the bottom of the ground, and then they have to bounce up to the top and have a breath, and then they'll sink down again. And I think what you'll find is that some of that air might go into the gut to help them um, to help them breathe, at least to help them to float up to the surface and then sink again. But if you think about it carefully, the only place that a hippopotamus can really put air is into its lungs. It could suck it into the gut, I suppose. But if it did that, then it would float almost permanently, which I don't think it necessarily wants to do. But it might change the buoyancy, be able to go up and down at slightly different rates, depending on how much uh, air it has in its gut. But they definitely do not float in the same way that you might float. There are my favorite antelope just up ahead. Oh, Scott has got some mongoose, but if he doesn't mind, I'm just going to quickly look at these nyalas. Some beautiful Nyala bulls. Don't want to lift, look a gift horse in the mouth, Brian. Mm -hmm. the last two drives we went on, I didn't find any mammals at all. It's a whole bachelor herd of young Nyala bulls here. They're beautiful. This is kind of, they're not any of them full size Nyala bulls yet, which is why they're tolerating each other and happily moving with it, one another. A little bachelor herd. In fact, this is a very large bachelor herd of Nyala bulls. And while we look at them, Sparkle, you're in Toronto, which is of course in Canada. And Nicola, it's not the capital of Canada, even though you might think so. Um, and you want to know how big the area that we traverse is. 
sparkle, it is 1,500 hectares. And in acres, I think you work in hectares in Canada, but in acres, that would be about, if you multiply by two and a half, we're looking at roughly four and a half thousand acres. So not a massive piece of land compared with where, what it might be in various parts of this area, um, but that's our kind of signal limit at the moment. Certainly plenty big enough to provide exquisite entertainment and really nice discoveries on a daily basis. Okay, from the Nyala Bulls, let's head across to Scott, find out what he's got. I think he's got some little mongoose to show you. So, from a much larger mammal to one of the smallest, at least of carnivores, that we get to see in this area. Sadly, it's just poked its head right behind the bush. It was positioned perfectly via I wonder if there's, if you can see that one that's higher up, right closer to the top of the mound that's poking its head out. No, there's bushes obstructing you there. But there is one also. Kind of slap bang in the center of your screen. As the wind blows the leaves, you can faintly make out its face on the top left-hand corner of your screen. But there's good news. There's lots of members of this little troop of mongooses, and they have got a number of little kind of cavities and holes that they're living in, some of which are in this termite mound to our left. But they'll also have holes that are underground, also old termite mounds, but not the large fungus growing termites that create these large mounds. And they'll also use little fallen down logs and tree stumps as little areas to seek refuge and shelter. So we are going to wait here for a second and see if the adults with the youngsters. Oh, there goes the youngster. Oh, no, Vim was busy leveling it off. But at the far tree stump, Vim will be your best bet, I think. There we go. There you can see a head poking out of the ground. And that looks to me like a mother. A youngster just popped in next to her. And I'm sure if we just wait a moment or two, we'll get to see them all coming out and playing around. They're basically the size of a rat, I guess, is something that a lot of you would be able to relate to. It's a very small mongoose, hence the name of the dwarf mongoose. Oh, that looks like a youngster there. Yeah, it is. It's half the size of the adult. Look at how cute that is. And I think I can see the head of another youngster poking out there. Could be several litters, it appears, within this troop. Look how quick they are! Clambering to their next point of safety, which again was a termite mound there. So they'll know this area well, and that is what puts them in good health, I guess, against other predators that will feed on them, being so small. They are basically, basically at the bottom of the food chain. Oh, there come a few more youngsters. And just like the prey animals, small predators like this will be incredibly nervous in windy conditions. They are going to be losing their ability to hear as well. Any kind of leaf moving above them or tree blowing in the wind may resemble an eagle swooping down on them, so that's why they'll be on high alert. I'm not sure if you can hear their pipe-pitched communication. Psst, 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 psst. It's like a very high-pitched whistle almost that they use to communicate with one another. Hello, Ken, and very happy to hear that you love these live safaris. Thank you for those kind words. And 
You're interested to know how long would it take for a termite mound to be formed? It is a question that I will not be able to answer accurately, sadly. I have no idea. But they are phenomenal structures, and I'm, I mean, obviously, depending on the, the, the many variables, the food, the luck of any given colony, you know, the weather conditions over that period of time, I'm guessing it's going to be, you know, at least 10 to 15 years for a decent sized mound to be developed. But I've never been fortunate enough to, to watch one from start up till present date. What will happen though, Ken, is that when a queen does die, uh, other queens may take over from that termitarium. So you may find different generations of queens rolling over. It won't only be one queen that raises her empire, dies, and then it all collapses and uh, falls dormant and becomes a very important structure for other animals, I guess, like mongooses. Um, some will be carried on, and I'm guessing the massive ones that we're seeing are ones that have had multiple queens over multiple generations. The queens can live for quite some time. I don't know why, I can't think of the exact age that they can live for now. But I'm thinking it's in excess of 10 years. I think it's 10 to 15 years that the queen can survive. So quite a long time. I stand to be correct there. And they certainly are very interesting and important structures in our ecosystem. To know a little bit more about them would be wonderful. Tom and Dallas, I'm just going to shoot through this little dip. The signal can sometimes be shaky here. Big leopard poo. Always exciting to see. Are you still with me, guys? That is a very big and tasty leopard dropping. Who knows who it belongs to? Maybe the leopard we just saw a little bit earlier. I'm going to jump out and show you its track, though. And also play around with that poop to see how fresh it is. Can be difficult. Just like us, um, leopards will have different consistency poops depending on the day. This looks like quite a solid, healthy poop. Okay, the leopard. I just want to make sure I don't come downwind of it. But here you can see its paw prints. This is the clearest one. And I'm using my flashlight to simulate the sun. One, two, three, four toes. The back pad. And oh, there's a little grasshopper in his one toe that boinks. He disappeared. Whew. This is smelly. Okay. Now, I think this could be from sometime during the course of the day. The tracks are on top of the rain, so it's definitely after the rain fell at about 5.30 till about 6 o'clock this morning. So the leopard was here quite recently. How recently, though, is difficult to tell. I'm going to get a little stick to probe this nice and solid. But this is probably the way it came out. Lots of fur in here as well. Um, it's a male leopard's track, not a female leopard's track, as far as I can tell. And what I'm gonna do is just, this is our northern boundary, so a tricky area to try and track down a leopard because he could well have disappeared north. If he crosses over here, then he'll disappear out of our property. So if you don't mind, just giving me a moment or two to try and establish whether in fact he's continued along this road, whether in fact he may have crossed north, or whether in fact he may have crossed into Juma, thus giving us a hope of trying to find him. We will obviously hopefully have some good news for you. So James is ready. We're going to have a quick snoop around here and give you an update in the next couple of minutes. 
Okay, we've done a figure of eight around that block and I found no sign of any lion whatsoever. Indeed, no cat, no predator, nothing. So we're going to do one more drive along another road, the only road that we haven't driven so far in this area today. And we'll see if something pops out there. If it doesn't, let's rather go and look at that elephant. What do you think, Brian? Yeah. There's an elephant just up ahead, everybody. Look, there it is. Look how cleverly hidden it is. Looks like a bull on his own. Might be a herd. I can only see one, but you can see how well hidden he is. And therefore, it is quite possible that there are others also hidden in the woodland. I love the way the grey juxtaposes with that golden orangey green. Anyway, he's in quite a nice area. It's a very pretty area in there. Let's see if we can get a bit closer, and hopefully he won't react to us, and he will be calm and enjoy having us around rather than moving away. That's a spot of luck, Brian. Mm. First large animal I've seen in days. What have you got? Oh, my goodness, look at that. Two Batelier eagles. What a brilliant spot. <laughs> Isn't that magnificent? Look at them. Now, this pair lives around here. I haven't seen them in that tree before. They've got a nest close by. And the other day, there were three of them. There were two males and the female. And we wondered if he wasn't sort of trying to take you sort of usurp and um, uh, take away this fellow's lady, or if perhaps it wasn't a youngster from a previous sort of child raising, but it is unlikely because it does take them seven, month, seven years to get to that adult plumage, and the other bird that came in was definitely fully adult. So that is the Batelier eagle. And you can see a very clear indication that his feet are not feathered all the way down to the legs, which means that he's not what we call a true eagle. And they eat largely carrion. They will eat sort of reptiles and the odd snake as well, however. Now, Adam, interesting question from you. You've been reading the Africa Geographic blog, and you say that they posted a picture of a martial eagle having killed an impala. I've seen a very similar one very recently of a crowned eagle doing exactly the same thing. Now, it would have been a young impala, probably from this year. And Adam, you want to know how it's possible that a bird of, say, 12 kilograms is able to kill an uh, impala of, say, 20 to 30 kilograms? How on earth can that be possible? And where, how does the kill happen? It's normally on impact, Adam. Those, the talons, uh, the strength, in the tarsal muscles of a martial or crowned eagle is quite astonishing. If they were to stand on your wrist, like they do if you're doing falconry, for example, they have the strength enough to crush your bones. So they could break your wrist just by standing on you and squeezing. So they've got incredible power in those talons. They also will hit their prey with an immense force. So they'll come in at an incredible speed drive their talons into the flesh of their prey. Uh, normally, in a f and the prey will be killed outright. Otherwise, if it isn't, they will then keep sort of jumping up and down and squeezing their talons into vital parts of the body and pecking viciously. They are not to be trifled with. And I have, Adam, actually seen it. I've seen martial eagles taking young impala in my first week, actually, as a trainee guide at Pinda down in Natal, we watched two martial eagles come flying down into this floodplain, and they smashed a baby impala. It was the most astonishing thing to see. The crowned eagle, of course, is renowned for having the most powerful talons and powerful tarsal muscles. And what they are renowned for doing is killing monkeys and they grab them on the back of their head and they drive that rear talon straight through the back of the head, back of the skull. And in fact, we found pre-hominid 
or hominid remains in South Africa that seem to have been killed by crowned eagles. They have one sort of single, very distinctive hole in the back of the skull, quite possibly from a crowned eagle. Marvellous. Well done, Brian. I thought it was a leopard, but... It was almost. 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 Nice, nice pattern here. Well done. Elephant is just up ahead. Let's go and have a look. I thought, you know, as VM found a leopard, maybe Brian would also. I don't think this elephant is particularly pleased to see us. As we saw the batelier, he did kind of turn his ears out as if to say, I'm not comfortable, go away and leave me alone. Let's just see. If he isn't comfortable, we won't spend any time with him. And elephants will not normally, on days like this, be as comfortable as they are on still days when they can hear and smell. And it's an evolutionary throwback, I think. They've got almost nothing to be afraid of out here. He's just melted into the bush. That's unbelievable. He's somewhere through here. So while I was waffling on about the batelier, he slinked off. Now, Tony, you're in London and you're wondering about the Sand River. And the Sand River is about three and a half kilometers from, or oh, seven kilometers from us as the crow flies, directly behind where we're driving. And you want to know if it is dry all the time. It is not. It is actually a perennial river. It's dry at the moment, though, because of the drought. It is dry. So there's the odd pool left in it, but otherwise there's nothing in it at all. And in the, all the years that I've been in and around this area, I haven't seen it dry. And you see him. Brian can see him. And while we're trying to find this elephant, the fellow that he is, Tony, you want to know if the denser vegetation is more heavily populated, more thickly populated? Is there more game there? Um, Yes, certainly, it definitely is. I mean, the, the rivers are definitely concentrated areas for animals to move to, but they also move away from them um, up to places like this, where there's good grazing a lot of the time and some good browsing, and also, especially, they move away from the rivers to get away from predators. You will find predators will concentrate along water sources. Watch out there, Brian. Oh, watch out, everybody. Kitty. Okay. Oh, there he is. I can just see him meandering through the bush. Now, they look like they're meandering, but if they want to move, they move pretty quickly, do elephants. And Kitty, you say you watched the rain dance that we did the other night. Oh, dear. You watched the rain dance that we did the other night in fast motion, and in upstate New York, it resulted in a snowstorm. I'm very glad you think that I'm capable of delivering you weather like that. I'm sorry about it. I hope it does. Ooh, it wasn't too cold. Brian, you're still there? Yeah. Okay. Brian's all right. He's performing astonishing feats of athleticism, sticking his leg out, moving the branches. This elephant is strolling through here and making a fool of me. Stop, Mr. Elephant. Stop. He's not running at all. He's just gently moving along, eating his tea, I suppose it would be. Maybe two of them here, actually. There's one there. Of course, now I've driven through every single artifact hole on the reserve. There's the elephant in front of us. Mimi, you are 15 and you are in Ohio. 
where we get a lot of questions, and that's marvellous. Mimi, you want to know about the termite queen, and Scott was talking about her earlier. I'm just going to try and sneak over this branch without making too much noise. Yeah. Well, if the elephant's deaf, he won't have heard that. Uh, Mimi, and... If you want to know what happens when the queen dies in a termite mound, and no doubt Scott told you about the queen being that big and kind of an enormous bulbous ab abdomen that produces 20,000 eggs a day. Mimi, if she dies after her 15-year lifespan, the termite mound will normally go to ruin, unless she is replaced. And she could be replaced from within the mound. That is possible. But when she dies, remember, she stops making eggs. And she's the only one in the mound that's making eggs. And those workers and soldiers don't live very long. They live a couple of weeks at a time before they die. Now, this elephant is trying to get away from us, I'm afraid. And so we're going to give up trying to follow him. You can just see him walking through there. We could try and get out onto the cut line, onto the cheetah cut line, see if he isn't going to come across. We might do that, but... It is quite thick in here. Anyway, this is in general keeping with my luck for the last few days. But perfectly normal for an elephant to exhibit a behavior that you might consider unusual because it is windy, like I say. He can't smell where the different smells are coming from because the wind is swirling. He's hearing all sorts of things all over the place. He looks like a young bull, which means he will be inevitably more nervous than, say, a big old adult who is uh, very confident in his own ability and strength. So I think that's why he doesn't really want anything to do with us. There he goes slight view of him there. And what I would like you to look at while Brian looks in on him, you see how he's swinging, he's just swinging slightly to the right and now he'll swing slightly to the left. That's it. And again to the right maybe. And that's him watching us. That's how they walk if they're looking behind them. They just swing from side to side having a look at what you're doing. That was nice to see. I think we're going to leave him, everyone. I'm afraid he's not very happy to see us. He's just, I don't want to make him uncomfortable. We do have normally, normally some great elephant sightings, so I think we'll leave him alone and continue on our way. Hopefully there'll be another one. You're not far from the road. Let me just carry on going. B, you're 11, and you want to know if hawks and eagles kill in the same way. Um, it depends, really, on where you are, B, because a hawk, to you, I think you're in the States, a hawk in the States is normally different from what we would define as a hawk. A hawk out here, by definition, the word to hawk means to catch something in the air. So an eagle would normally catch something on the ground, they'd smash it in the, on the ground, and then eat it there. And you say the hawks in your backyard kill your, your bunnies, like I've just described the eagles doing. Well, I'm sorry about that. Luckily, bunnies are very good at making more of themselves. Um, but out here, a hawk traditionally... Oh, look, 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 look. Well spotted, Brian. That's a Cokie Franklin, everybody. So B, a hawk out here wouldn't really catch one of these because they don't fly, or well, they do fly, but a hawk here would normally catch their prey in the, in the air. And something like a hawk eagle, for example, would catch a Franklin on the ground. But, but some hawks will be catch animals on the ground like the eagles do, but the whole, the word hawk means to catch something in the ground, at least to catch something in the air. Isn't that beautiful? He's one of our five Franklin species, and I think by far the most beautiful. The golden head, that is an astonishingly beautiful golden color. Look at that, that's the male. The female didn't have that golden head. As with most birds, the female is just a bit more drab than the male. Shame. 
fact, with all birds, I can't think of one bird where that isn't the case. I can think of many, many instances where that isn't the case with human beings, but... Uh, with birds, not so. Now, they will be walking around normally eating seeds, and you can see him fossicking around there, trying to find himself something delicious to eat. But, of course, there are going to be very few seeds around at the moment, on account of the fact that we haven't had much rain. And so what that means is that they're going to have to find other sources of food. And other sources of food for a bird like that would include things like insects, maybe the olive spider, and perhaps even a scorpion or two, a very small scorpion. Isn't he lovely? He doesn't think we're watching him, you see, that's why he's so relaxed. Very nice indeed. Now, Joel, you are clearly a highly educated fellow with regard to ornithology and that sort of thing, and you say in Kazakhstan they use steppe eagles, which do pop out here every year, to, for falconry. They use them for falconry, and you want to know if there's any traditional culture out here that has ever done falconry. Joel, to my knowledge, no. There is no falconry that goes on out here other than sort of people who've learned how to do it from uh, European traditions or from Asian traditions or even Arabian traditions. But no, no indigenous cultures here have ever taken up falconry. And the steppe eagle, of course, is ma largely out here, a termite eater. It's this immense bird, and you think of him, so you can imagine him a bit like a marshal or a crowned, sort of descending on antelope and eating them and, and scrub hairs and all that sort of thing. But instead, they are largely termite-eating birds, which I've always found quite fascinating. Now, normally these things don't let us get anywhere near this close to them. They're normally running away. There's the female, Brian. If you look behind, you might just... No, you can't. Ah, now, Lucy, you say that this Cokie Franklin is a new bird for you. You're a bird list keeper and you say that this takes you to number 175. That's a pretty impressive list of birds, I have to say. There are probably a total species list here you could expect to see if you were, if you came into the area for the first time and you spent a couple of weeks here. I mean, well, let's say you spent a summer season here. I think you'd find that the most number of birds you'd see would be about 210. So 175 on the back end of a sort of, uh, you know, a, a live safari where birds are not easy to see on the cameras, I think is a really impressive total. You anyway, know, he doesn't seem to be doing a great deal other than watching us, which I think is quite fun. So let's press on, shall we? And Tom in Dallas, you want me to repeat the name. His name is Okoki Franklin. That's C-O-Q-U-I, as far as I remember. Let me just check my bird app. I think that's pretty, I'm pretty sure that's how you spell it. Koki Franklin, and he's, it's an onomatopoeic name. I'll play you his call. Koki. No, I've definitely got it wrong because the search function can't find it. <laughs> Here we go. Cool. Yes. Is it? No, I was right. C-O-Q-U-I. C-O-Q-U-I. And here's the call. We'll see if we can make him call too. Oh dear, we've lost him again.
Here's the call. He's very cross now. He's coming forward to beat us up. Isn't this wonderful? I know it's, it might be considered slightly nasty. Look at him puffing his chest out. See him puffing his chest out there. Where on earth could it be, Mr. Franklin? So deeply confused. I don't think I'm going to do it again. I feel a, I feel a little bit bad, but he looks like he wants to have a fight. Of course, he's he wants to defend his uh, d defend his his territory and his maiden's honour in the face of this obvious incursion. He's just, he's very cross, and you can see he's puffed his chest out. Shall we call him once more? Yeah, once more. It won't, be, it won't be too nasty for him. <laughs> they never get this close to us, everyone. He's only about three feet from the edge of the car. climb under the car. Hold the phone out here. Is he still there? Oh, there's Mrs. There's Mrs. Isn't she lovely? Here, he's coming around the front, right? Here he is. I think we'll stop terrorizing him now. There goes Mrs. Oh Sorry. <laughs> that was great. What a wonderful, wonderful sighting of the most beautiful ground dwelling bird that we have here, I think. Don't worry, fellow, you are actually alone. Fear not. You are correct. <laughs> All right, let's head on from here. See what else the world has to offer us at the moment. Wasn't that great? Let's head across to Sydney's Dam, where Scott is waiting. I'm not sure what's there, but Scott will tell you and surprise you, no doubt. See you shortly. Hello, and welcome back. I stopped you specifically to try and find James's crocodile that I thought I'd seen. But he's your the no sign of that. Um, you can hear somebody trying to find out what's going on at the hyena den. I'm told somebody is there. But there's a couple of hippo that we can see. No sign of the crocodile. And this wassail has been hugely productive for us over the last few weeks. But now with all the puddles lying around, we'll find that a lot less animals will be relying on it. So I stopped you specifically to try and show you the crocodile, but no joy. What I'd like to now do is head off to the, whoop, the western portions of Juma and 
Just check some areas there. I know nobody would have checked the western, or nobody did check the western portions of Juma this morning. So always useful to just go for a quick swoop through an area like that. You may find three leopards all in the same tree with a baby dinosaur that they've killed, and merely because nobody's driven there, no one knows about it. So that's why rather than driving around the same area that we have been checking for the lions, Let's go into a new area and see if we can't find any fresh evidence or sign. I couldn't work out where that male leopard who made a poop on our northern boundary went. The ground becomes very, very hard after rain. It almost solidifies like cement. Uh, therefore, after it, it needs to dry up, vehicles need to drive over, it needs a, a thin layer of fine dust to be recreated in order to be able to see tracks more easily. So, gave up on that. Ah, James Richards. You would like to swing past uh, the little crab hole that we know of on Zoe's Road to see what's going on there. When I drove past it yesterday, um, I saw a few bubbles kind of come out of that hole, but the water level was above the hole. So you couldn't see the crab. And let's go there and have a look. We'll go there and have a look, James, because that is the area that I plan on searching when nobody did search this morning. So. We'll go and see what's happening. An unhappy squirrel here. It's just on the horizontal limb over there at my finger VM. I'm hoping it's going to call again and we'll get to see it. More importantly, I'm hoping that we're going to find what exactly it is shouting at. Could be a leopard. Could be us. Could be a false alarm. Could be a snake. Who knows? Come on. One more arm call. Nope. Therefore, I would assume that it panicked because of our presence. It looked like a small squirrel, so maybe young and inexperienced. But always worth stopping and investigating. Kitty Bang Bang, you would like to know which is bigger, a dwarf mongoose or a squirrel? And I would say that they are identical in size. But let's check. Maybe my book will be able to furnish us with some um, better squirrel. How do you spell squirrel? With an S and then a Q. But I get to SQ and I don't find any squirrel. English two common names. Anyway, let's try and find the mongooses to start with. LM mongoose, there we go. Dwarf 264. Okay. Weight, 220 to 350 grams on average. So there we go. These are our dwarf mongoose friends. Now, to try and find the tree squirrel. Let me go back to the index. And I would like you to all journey with me. Here we go. QRS. Okay, we're going to send you over to James quickly. He's got some birds all lined up and ready for action. Look at that, everyone. Little white crown shrikes. I'm sure they must be fairly new. They're not communal birds at all. I'm sure those are recently fledged from the nest, and they're all huddling for warmth on little branches around here. Let's sneak forward and see if we can't see them again. We first spotted them much closer than that, but they didn't really like the sound of the vehicle. There they go. Oh, I think they're 
Um, no, they're off. Oh. Mm. oh. I can't see them anymore. Anyway, that was the White Crown Shrike. Let's go back to Scott. He's got something to show you in his book. Okay, well, sadly, my book appears not to have what we are looking for. They've got ground squirrels, but not tree squirrels, which is what we're looking for here. So I can't find you the weights of them, but I'm sure that they are very, very similar in size and weights. Like I said, though, these aren't the, the critters we're looking for. This is an interesting creature that we also don't get here, called the spring hare. It's like part kangaroo, part rabbit. It jumps on its back legs. Um, and those two little front arms stay elevated as it moves, as it propels itself through the bush. It's a nocturnal critter. Cool. Well, Nicky's kindly offered to try and work out the size of a tree squirrel so we can get to the bottom of that. But, like I say, I'm guessing it is going to be a very similar size to the dwarf mongooses. Toby, I think uh, earlier on you asked uh, a question. I couldn't finish it off because of the um, different mongooses we get you, and you'd like to know the differences between the slender and the white-tailed mongoose. And sorry, that was Tom, not Toby. And they, I guess, are both more rare than the dwarf mongoose. Those are the mongoose we see more commonly than any others. We also do get banded mongoose here that are similar to dwarf mongoose in their lifestyle. They move during the day and they also live in large, large troops. So, much larger though than the dwarf mongoose and they've got very uh, pretty bands on their coats. So we get those two daytime species. The slender mongoose, not as common in this area. Also a daytime mongoose, quite shy and secretive. And often when we do see them, they run off into the bush. Um, the white-tailed mongoose, again, not nearly as common as the dwarf mongoose. They aren't as gregarious here. Yeah? And they are nocturnal, so that'll be another reason why we don't see them too often. Interesting, the American red squirrel, thanks Tom, is a very similar weight, 230 to 340 grams, I think it is, so much of a muchness with the dwarf mongoose, whose weight we just got out the book. Uh, let me try and fix my lapel here. Get it in my shirt. As I'm told, you guys are having some trouble with the wind that it's picking up. That should help. Hi, oh, thank you very much. Coincidence that the windy weather has caused me to put my button my mic away and at the same time one of our viewers called Wendy sent through the weight of the tree squirrel which is around 200 grams. So we've got to the bottom of that. Thank you very much. And not only a big thank you to Wendy but a big thanks to everyone who is now has just sent through all of the weights of these squirrels that we're hoping to find out. They're all flooding in to the final control room now. Angie, you say you are waiting to see some tree frogs, Scott or James. You obviously weren't tuned into the sunset safari yesterday because we saw one then. So, sorry for you. 
only kidding, Angie. Um, <laughs> um, we would love to find you some more tree frogs. And who knows, maybe I'll get a chance to drive past that same tree where I saw one yesterday. And it could still be there. They do like set spots, the tree frogs, that I've noticed. Hello, Lady Giraffe. Chewing the cud. And this is going to be cool. She's about to finish this mouthful. We're going to be able to see her swallow it shortly. And then we may see her regurgitate the next bolus of cut up into mouth. Oh, there's a couple of giraffe. Okay, I think she has just swallowed. Try and zoom in there quick, VM, if you don't mind. We may see the next bolus of cud. Oh, there we go. Boom. Popped into her mouth there. You may have just caught the end of that. Interesting to see how different the shades are of these two. The one on the left is a light brown, the one on the right is a darker, dirtier brown, and there's still two more coming that look like possibly the offspring of these fine ladies. Another three. Look at this. Awesome. Where have you guys come from? I haven't seen this many giraffe in quite some time. I'm just going to reverse quickly. Try and get us into the best possible spot to watch them come past us. Well, Rusty Pipes, you've just come th forward with a very interesting fact, and that is that the North American pronghorn... Oh, look at that. Is that a scar? That does look like a big scar. Well spotted, VM. That the North American pronghorn is related to the giraffe. Fascinating. I wonder what other African species it may be related to, if it is just the giraffe and... Obviously, before all of the continents split, the pronghorn and the giraffe were possibly evolving from a similar species or the same species. And that is a first to me, so thank you, Rusty Pipes, for that info. What a wonderful scene this is. As this journey of giraffe or tower of giraffe to different collective nouns that can be used for them. They can be great sentries to help find animals and I'm just watching this individual, she's scanning off uh, to the west now, and who knows what she can see up there, from up there at least. Some of you will remember the awesome sighting. Oh, there was another bonus of cud just, just popped into her mouth. Some of you will remember the epic sighting of a giraffe that helped us find Shadow, who we then watched and waited as she called desperately looking for her young male cub, who eventually arrived onto the scene and we were spoiled with a wonderful, wonderful reunion of the two of them. Shortly after which they started, or well, she started snarling at him. Bizarre behavior, but happy, happy memories of that day. That was a truly wonderful sighting. And a good example of how a giraffe can be so effective at finding us predators. Just listening to the game drive radio, they found a leopard, but it sounds like it's out of our area. 
of Traverse. Okay, so I've got an idea of where the leopard is. It is north of us, and I'm just going to check on my map now exactly how far away that is from us. You guys can continue watching the giraffe while I work out where this leopard is. It may be just useful for us to know because we may be able to try and keep ourselves in the general area for a little bit later on in the evening. Okay, well, we're going to race you across to James, who's got an interesting sighting waiting for you. Just quickly, everybody, I think that that is a dark form Wahlberg's eagle. The nest is not too far from here. There's that Wahlberg's who lives with her pale, with a pale form. They're a pair that come back to a nest here every single year. And they're just one thing interesting I want to show you about this bird is that he's disproving a lot of misconceptions. We tend to think of birds as sleeping with their heads under their wings. They don't do that. What they do is they turn their heads almost 180 degrees and rest the head so that the muscles don't have to work on the kind of shoulder. And that's what he's doing there. And then they do sometimes stand on only one leg while they're sleeping. And that is not, it's so that they can fold that leg up inside and under the feathers and that reduces the amount of heat loss through the legs. Isn't that amazing? Anyway, other than those quite interesting facts, he's not a particularly interesting sighting. So let's head back to Scott and his giraffe, and we're going to continue towards Treehouse Dam. Wow. I don't blame that eagle for being all curled up in a ball. It is getting nippy. I've just put my jacket on, and I guess a good indicator of just how windy it would be is this young giraffe's little tufts on its Aussie cones, Viam, that are blowing in the wind. <laughs> they, <u> <laughs> they're usually not that long. It's just the youngsters that have these kind of hairy Aussie cones and uh, a cute view of it. It's older sibling there, which looks like it could be a young male. I just need to double check between the legs. Not easy from this angle. But the slightly larger one does look like a young male. Um, slightly larger Aussie cones than this youngster. A couple of ox peckers grooming through its coat looking for ticks. Kathy in Memphis, Tennessee, you would like to know a little bit more about the hair, little tufts of hair on top of those Aussie cones. There's not much that I can tell you about them other than the fact that they are longer when they are young and as they become older they kind of shorten let's look at the mother that's just come back into frame here vm on the left you'll see hers aren't nearly as long and wispy the males will be completely bald on top once they are of age once they mature that's why i'm not sure if that other kind of in-betweener that we saw is a young male Judging by the thickness of those ossicones, it looks to me like he is. Yeah, he is a young male. I've just got a view between his legs that can confirm that for me. And Kimby, you were just asking if these were in fact all females, and no, I'm guessing that's a young male from a previous litter. Previous litter. <laughs> previous generation, rather. They don't have litters of young the giraffe. That was absolute nonsense that came out of my mouth. Um, but yeah, possibly offspring from a prior generation. times cut it needs to be chewed 
before infected goes into the final fourth chambered of chambered stomach and I don't have a clue maybe somebody else knows um, they'll need to chew on it at least once to get into the first stomach and then they'll regurgitate it I'm guessing maybe just once that they re-chew on it once it's been broken down a little bit by the digestive juices oh we're getting some incredible views here look at this Look at this. This is so cool. Look at that long tongue of hers trying to assist as she feeds on a very thorny acacia tree. Got nasty little hook thorns. Hello to Elizabeth in California. You're interested to know how long will giraffes stay with their mothers, young giraffes? And I would say up to about two to three years would be my guess. I'm not sure of the exact finer details there. Um, but I'd, uh, yeah, I would say at least uh, at two years. Even now we can see a few youngsters staying with their adults and they must be around the two year mark before they go off and do their own thing. You may find that females may stay with their mother for even longer than that, just join into the herd, whereas males will be more inclined to leave sooner, go off and do their own thing, join a small bachelor group. Hello, Randall in Illinois. You are interested to know the longevity of giraffes. And I would say that they live for anywhere between 15 and 20 years. But you guys are stumping me with these questions you're sending through. I'm not too confident that I'm exactly correct. So I'm going to just check in my book quickly. I don't think my book is going to furnish me with any really useful information there, but let me see. <laughs> okay, average lifespan in the wild is 25 years, according to some studies. So I was a little bit, I didn't give them enough credit there. I only said 15 to 20. As a general rule, though, Randall and everyone, the bigger the animal, the longer they live for, especially with the herbivores. The small antelope don't live for nearly as long as the big antelope or herbivores. Well, wonderful. Thank you, Jerry Giraffes, for your hospitality. to have you with us. You would like to know if the giraffe are not as spooked by the windy conditions because of their tall vantage point, their bird's eye view. And yes, I think that is a very, very plausible theory. They will, however, be a little bit more nervous in the wind. Even just the movements of bushes can throw animals like giraffe off because they might not be sure what is moving. Is it an animal? Is it a predator? Is it just a bush? But yes, judging by their mood and that side, I think they're not nearly as skittish as some of the other animals that are closer to the ground. Take your mic with me, make sure it's pointing up. It is pointing up. Oh, no, it's not. There we go, VM. VM worked out that my mic, mic was pointing downhill, but I don't know how I'm going to rectify this because
this. If it's going to be tucked into my shirt. When in doubt, gaffer tape. Let's see if we could do some running repairs here. some exciting prospects. He is off the vehicle following up on some alarm calls. So maybe, just maybe, he's going to be back in the vehicle shortly with some good news regarding a predator that he has just found. It's an exhilarating feeling getting off the vehicle and going exploring, especially when there's alarm calls in any area. But you do have to prepare yourself for the worst because so often you come up with nothing. And I'm sure James, with all his experience, is fully aware of that. Oh, there's an African hawk eagle being chased by a fork-tailed drongo. I'm just going to try and pick a spot where we can stop to get you some views of it. But I don't think we're going to be lucky just here. Let's keep going. It's one of my favorite things to see. Ah. Tiny little fork-tailed drongo is chasing a far larger predatory bird, the African hawk eagle, but it was just flying too low for us to try and stop and show you. I needed to try and race into a gap. We may still get a glimpse of it. It was flying in this direction like this, kind of. Aha! Uh -huh. James has just got back to the vehicle, so why don't you guys go and find out what exactly was going on over there. Now we had some uh, kudu alarm calling around here, everyone. We were driving along, thought that there was some kind of a sound turned off. Turned out there was some kudu. We drove along the road just opposite this drainage line, found the kudu. They ran off in an opposite direction. I walked into the block to see if I could see anything. I didn't see anything. But we're now going to drive along this road and just see perhaps, maybe, perhaps, if we're lucky, a leopard walked past here. I don't think it would have been lions because I think there would have been easy to spot. Now the kudu were just opposite where we are now. So we just hope to see the telltale flicking white tail of a leopard or maybe a pride of lions on this side. Maybe the wind just changed and caught the kudu. It was right here. That's where they were. See the light already starting to fade, so it will make the animals inevitably more skittish. And we're just looking at the ground here, seeing if there are any tracks, but that, there is a cap on the road as a result of the rain, so not easy to see tracks, especially if it's from something light like a leopard. Rita, you're in Johannesburg. Why are we driving along here hoping to find a leopard? Um, I'm going to answer your question. You will excuse me if I don't look you in the eye, Rita. You want to know about the Nyala, and you've read and heard that they are not endemic to this area and that they are taking over the habitat from the Kudu and why, therefore, are they allowed to remain? Why aren't they removed and relocated somewhere else? Rita? I am unconvinced by arguments that they are not endemic to this area. Uh, certainly, well, they're not endemic, um, but they are, I'm unconvinced that they're not indigenous to this area. And I don't know who came up with that or why they say that. 
as far as taking away habitat from the kudu, they actually have a very different feeding niche. You'll find that kudu feed much higher up than Nyala can. That's the whole thing with the tragolavids. The kudu, Nyala, and bushbuck have separate trophic niches. In other words, they feed on different things. And so I don't believe that to be true, I'm afraid, Rita. I think that there was a lot of misconception in the early days of the Kruger Park Especially, you know, we took a lot of the um, sort of reports from hunters of the early 18th or 19th century as kind of gospel truth. And I think that created quite a lot of misconception as to what was going on. So, Rita, I don't think that they are un not indigenous to this area. I think the provision of artificial water by human beings has possibly made it more conducive for them and therefore easier for them to live. That is well possible but I don't think that they're taking over any habitat from Kudu. Let's do one more loop of this area. I am filled with a sense of, well, increased somberness now. Oh, we haven't found anything. Unless we go up the other way, Brian. They may have been yelling across the drainage line or something. Well, keep going. Now, Wendy, you have seen a one-horned kudu. Uh, the horn broke off, obviously, and Wendy, you want to know, would it grow back again quickly, or will he remain with a stump for the rest of his days? I'm afraid, because the horn is part of the skull, in fact, it's just like any other bone, if you break it, it doesn't grow back again. So it will heal at the site of the damage, but it won't grow back again. It's completely unlike an antler that would be found on a deer. And so, no, Wendy, I'm afraid that one-horned kudu is going to be a unicorn for the rest of his days. You see, I can, there are tracks here where these kudu were running. But what they were running from he could easily have driven past a leopard three or four times, of course. They are very clever at hiding. So we'll just drive very slowly along here, everyone. Keep an eye out on the right-hand side of the road. Whatever it was may even step up into the road. There was a wildebeest here, and Brian thought maybe the leopard, or at least, sorry, the leopard, the kudu, were alarming at the wildebeest. We both agreed that that was unlikely, but it's not impossible, especially on a day like this, where it's difficult to smell, difficult to see, light is fading. Diane and Claire in Canada, you've done some research on perhaps that male leopard and you've looked at your Dan House's photographs and you say it is the male leopard who I think, if I'm not mistaken, is called Gijima, G-I-J-A-M-A, G-I-J-I-M-A, correct? Yes, that would be, that is the Zulu word for run. And so that would be appropriate for that leopard. And so, yeah, wonderful stuff. Thank you for that. And apparently he was seen mating with Karula last year. There's a bird alarm calling up here. A long-billed crombeck going... I don't know, it feels like something's going on here. You hear the bird there, Brian? But there are also some very relaxed looking impala not too far away. What are you shouting at, bird? It's moving along through here. 
I'll just let you listen to it. I don't see any source of obvious alarm. Maybe there's a snake. It's definitely alarm calling. Can you see it there? Hey, look at him. Isn't that a wonderful shot? That's the long-billed Crombeck. He is deeply irked by something in here. And maybe for a few of you, it might be a new bird for your lists. Not easy to see unless they're totally distracted by something else. Anyway, let's carry on. Let me go around the other side of the dam. <laughs> no, I... <laughs> Sorry, Nikki, you're gonna have to go again with that name. It's all distorting in my ear, I'm afraid. Draw, is that what you got, Brian? Yeah. Draw! Draw, you began your bird list just yesterday, and you have got 13 birds. Well, I mean, that's pretty good taking for one day. And I hope the long-billed Crombeck is another one. I think that's pretty good. The Koki Franklin must surely have been a new one for you today. And possibly those African hawk eagles that Scott showed you would have been new ones as well. So we're now on the dam wall, gives us a bit of elevation. And Tom, apparently that's a new one for you, so you're quite excited about that. Good stuff. Now this damn wall seems to be subsiding on each side every time I go over it. And so I never want to look to the side when we're going over the top. And I think Let's head across to Scott for a little while. I just want to spend a little bit more time in this area and don't want to bore you to tears. So let's head back across to Scott for a little while and I'll keep you updated if I find anything. Well, I think it's definitely worth uh, leaving James and Brian to try and work out what is going on there. It's incredibly difficult to try and concentrate on you as well as try and find animals in a scenario like that. So best we leave them to it. And perfect timing because we are approaching the little mud wallow where there is a crab that has been living for quite some time. It was pointed out to me by an old presenter, Mark Weiner, who was incredible with a lot of the smaller details, the smaller critters and creatures, and he had immense knowledge of Juma from spending a lot of time here in the past. So, he told me about the crab that lives in this tiny little hole within what is usually a dry mud wallow. And if you can, you can go in with the flashlight and see it sitting at the back of its burrow, waiting patiently for the rains to come. Obviously, the rains will then lead to food being brought into that little wallow. What on earth he's been doing, or how he's been surviving, or she rather, I don't know if it's a male or a female crab, but how this crab has been surviving during the droughts, I'm not too sure. I guess it's probably just practicing the same thing it does when in doubt, and that is to just keep still, basically lie dormant, waiting for better times. How many years it's been here for, I don't know, but I can confirm at least one. It was pointed out to me last summer, and this summer it is still here. Okay, we are approaching. Oh no, it's little wallows already tried up. This was full yesterday. Now we may even get lucky and from here be able to see down into that hole. Mm -hmm. Is it there? Yeah. Is that not just dry? Mm -hmm. I think it's just dry soil that's a different color. Although apparently you guys might be able to see little pincers on I, I certainly can't. I'm looking on my, oh, no ways. On the far right, you can see a pincer, I'm told. I can't, but obviously, let me try and reposition the vehicle ever so slightly. Isn't this fun? Keep zoomed in there, VM, if you don't mind. I'll just try 
and give us a slightly different angle. No. Oh, it's moving. I can see it's a crab. Oh, uh, now you can see that it's a crab. Awesome. Well, there we go, James. There's the crab. You can see the water level. If VM just zooms out a little bit, the water level was above the hole. You can see where all this foliage and the kind of dark versus light coloration indicates that it was completely submerged in water, but crabs can deal with that. Let me see if, oh, sorry, VM. If we can't roll forward a bit, get a slightly different view. Wunderbar. Well, there we go. There is the crab in its hole. I'm hoping it managed to forage on something to feed on. That that uh, moisture would have brought yesterday. Fascinating though that there's a crab living all the way out here. There's no rivers or water sources nearby. How it got here and how much longer it's going to be there for, I don't know. A bit of a lonely existence, sadly, it appears for it. Just fascinating and a reason why we are so lucky to be exploring this place day in and day out because we do get to know these kind of intricate, finer little details about of some of the less well-known stars of the African wilderness, but still really interesting stories that they have. And that is also the joy of you guys following us and joining us day in, day out for essentially what is going to be an infinite period of time. As long as the Safari Live experience keeps going the way it does, there's no reason why it should ever end. Obviously, we will need continued support, and the more support we get, the better. But this could continue forever, here at Juma, possibly. And imagine how much we'll be able to understand and learn and know about the animals of this area as the years go by. So, really exciting future prospects. Okay. Now, I know we got a glimpse of a leopard earlier. Um, so, hopefully now we'll be able to find you one of a little bit longer time of a female. We're in the area of where we could bump into Karula, the queen of Juma. So keep your eyes peeled. I know VM's got that side of the vehicle covered, but you guys can try and cover the other areas. Tony, you would like to know what is the lifespan of this type of crab, and I don't have a clue what type of crab that is. So, yeah, I'm, I'm no crab expert, so I do not know. But maybe just a general lifespan, if somebody can try and work that out of a freshwater crab, you know, we'd be able to learn a little a bit about them. But yeah, I'm, I'm clueless with regards to crustaceans and their lifespan. just mentioned that she thought my spirit animal was an urchin. It's not an urchin, Nikini. Nikini, it's an anemone with a Nemo in it. <laughs> uh, so, different story. <laughs> Marianne in Arkansas, no, I do not, I do not have a pick of uh, any crab, sadly, in my book. It's a mammal's book, not a crustacean book. And even if I did have a pick of various crabs, I've never seen that crab out of the hole, so I don't know what kind of crab it is. The only way to be certain would be to, I don't know, you, to get a really good view of it is first step, and to get a good, good view of something that lives in that little hole is not going to be easy. 
So that's why it hasn't been uh, something that I've been able to work out. Apologies. But like I say, maybe there's only... <laughs> Gerd is busy enjoying a crab sandwich <laughs> while watching the crab on Safari Live. But, oh sorry, not a crab sandwich, a crab salad. Low carb diet, Gerda, very nice. <laughs> um, yes, I don't know. I don't know uh, what else to say about that. But yes, we as humans do need to eat. Um, I guess as long as we are trying to do it sustainably, that's all we can really aim for. But yeah, I wish I had some more info on these crabs for you, but maybe you guys can help. Uh, maybe there's not too many freshwater crabs that occur in this part of South Africa. Um, I don't have the means of trying to research that now though. Look who we've spotted up ahead here. is a long distance visual of Brian Joubert and Mr. James Hendry. Look at them wobbling about. Boink, boink. Big thumbs up from Brian. And Angie, while they make their way to us, you'd like to know a little bit more about my hometown, Durban, as you are coming out here soon. Um, Angie, it's... Uh, Great city, it's a great city to be visiting in June or July when you'll be coming here. Oh, it looks like we are being filmed. Bye bye, well done, thank you for coming. Um, off they go, just like that, interesting stuff. <laughs> it looks like he's gonna stop and reverse. He likes to, he likes to play these games, Mr. Henry, where he pretends you don't even exist and then he comes back and makes you laugh with a funny joke, no doubt. Hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry, we have to make some fun of the entertainment out here. <laughs> I found it very entertaining, did thank you. you. Oh, good, um, thank you. I, I hope you did too, everyone. And Vim, did you find it entertaining? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, could you alarm calling on Treehouse Dam Road? No joy. No, nothing. Yeah. Okay. No tracks, but I mean tracks. Tracks are difficult. Spot. We were just kind of making wider circles. Okay. Well, I'll do the opposites. Okay. I'll go and make smaller circles. Marvellous. Good. Okay. See Master you later. plan. Thank you. Well coordinated. See you later, guys. Bye. So, Angie and Durban, you're coming in June or July. It's a good time to be visiting Durban, my hometown, because uh, it is going to be our winter, and Durban in summer is brutally, brutally hot and humid. Um, so, it's a good time of year to be there. Beautiful weather. Shouldn't be rain, although with the whole El Nino story that's affecting our current drought or causing this current drought, it's hard to say what the weather would be doing, but ordinarily great weather in June and July. Um, the beaches are nice. I don't know what exactly you want to know. There's lots of nice food, um, lots of different restaurants. Um, I don't, yeah. I don't, know, I don't know how much uh, exactly what you want to know. I don't know if you want to know about wilderness areas that surround there. I um, don't know if you want to go clubbing. <laughs> I don't know what you want to, want to do. So if you maybe pop FC an email as to what you're trying to find out, then I'll be able to try and get back to you with what exactly I recommend or suggest. So that is, that's going to be the, the best way to go about that. Good. I am sure you're looking forward to your trip, and I guess I'm actually now looking forward to hearing when you're coming, how long you're coming for exactly, and I can maybe try, well, I will be able to try and help you fine-tune your stay. Lucy in Indiana, you have come up with a marvelous idea. After James' successful rain dance, I mean, he did have some help uh, with David and Sam. Who knows, maybe they were the reasons. Their dance moves were quite spectacular, as were James's, though. Um, 
Either way, after the successful rain dance a few nights ago, you are suggesting that he should do some kind of an animal dance, and I agree. Um, my history uh, and expertise in this field uh, suggests that a four-legged uh, animal dance, therefore being on all fours, maybe even just running on all fours, would be a useful start. That was something that he could think of incorporating into that dance, and we'll be sure to pass that on to him. I'm not convinced, though, whether we will be able to get him to do that. I think he's going to try and rely on his experience of the African wilderness to try and track down game as opposed to rely on dance moves. Maybe he could bring out his guitar and play the animals a song. Maybe that's another angle that could be worked on. He could just sing to them, serenade them. Just heard an unhappy dwarf mongoose. Chee -chee, chee -chee. But all it warranted was a quick reverse, a quick scan, nothing to see, continue without feeling guilty for overlooking an alarm call. There we go. Well, we are now moving into the area that James has just moved out of. Maybe we will be able to have a bit more joy than him regarding finding what this kudu was barking at. And because you have been driving around here with him, we may as well send you off to some new scenery where he is right now. Toodle doo. I will be deeply, deeply irked to the core of my being if Scott drives around the corner there and finds a leopard or a lion where we were looking so ardently. In fact, I shall probably break down into tears. I may lie in front of the Land Rover. Brian, so, how will you feel? I will, I'll, I'll also be lying down in front of the Land Rover. Very good, good. Excellent. Um, I think it's probably, I was thinking about going to the hyena den, but I think it's probably a bit dark already to do that. Um, if the skies were clear, we might do that. I'm so glad, so glad that you saw that crab. That, uh, first Mark showed Scott, and Scott then showed me. We've just been past it now, again. That is, a, that is an amazing, amazing creature that has survived the drought. Can do apparently Scott didn't have a picture of it. I've got one of these multi guides which doesn't have to have much in depth information, but it does have a picture of what will be a similar kind of a freshwater crab. Uh, let me just find it. It's not a butterfly, is it, Brian? It's not no. the same as a butterfly at all, really. Similar, but not really. Similar, but not the same. No. A crustacean. Now, of course, it is a crustacean. And a crustacean, of course, is different from an insect or an arachnid. And they're sort of classed along with the uh, lower invertebrates, which I think is probably slightly unfair. Anyway, there is the freshwater crab. Uh, five pairs of limbs, of course. Remember that a crab is a cephalopod. It has got 10, uh, ten feet. And it just says, inhabits streams and shallow freshwater. It is dull to dark grey. No, no, that's a wood louse. Hang on. Inhabits streams and shallow fresh water, burrows into banks and forages there from feeding on detritus. So it'll feed on dead plant matter, basically. It'll probably also feed on dead. It's a scavenger. It'll probably feed on dead insects and that sort of thing as well. Male and female mate facing each other. Female carries eggs until they hatch throughout South Africa. Well, if this is a male or a female, it's a very lonely crab, and it's been there for at least a year. I don't know what the lifespan of a freshwater crab is. Now, I mean, it says here, order decapoda, okay? So it's a decapod, sorry, not a cephalopod. A decapod, uh, an order, for example, is an extremely wide-ranging group. So. Um, it would be like saying uh, it would be like saying a herbivore 
or a carnivore. It's that wide. So, I mean, there are probably hundreds of different sort of species of freshwater crabs, as there are hundreds of different species of herbivore. Um, and although they all look to, to us to be relatively similar, they all have different kinds of habits and do different things. And this one must have a particularly impressive way of finding friends, because if it's out there in that little hole on its own, I'd have no idea how on earth it's going to become a friend. You know, of course, um, this is going to be a very poor joke, I, I warn you, Brian. Um, you know what we call crabs that live on their own, and some, sometimes they live, in a, they live in shells. You know, when they like to be on their own, they are called hermit crabs. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sorry. I'll try and improve. So that's the fresh water crab. That fell horribly flat. Oh well, well, you know, you've got to try things every so often, day like today. You can see the light dropping hugely now. Scott seemed to be trussed up like a Scott of the Antarctic. Here's another poor joke for you. Scott of the Antarctic. Uh, it's not that cold. It's probably still about 23, 24 degrees Celsius at the moment, um, which was just about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, I think. So not too cold. But a chilly wind or chilly wind starting to blow. Am I still plugged in this way? And I think tonight, with any luck, there will be some <laughs> tonight with any luck there will be some more rain there's been lots of activity on the road here from zebra they've been walking up and down here look there the zebra right now look 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 Isn't that lovely? Look at that. So as we watch these zebra, and of, that is so cool. Look at that. They are so fast. Look at the speed that that animal is moving. They are just like any, any young mammal has to do this. Brian, this is incredible. I swear, any breeder of show-jumping horses would look at this with a great sense of envy. And that running around, so crucial for muscle development, so crucial. Up onto the top. Look at that. So the one on the top is slightly older than the one on the left but not an adult yet, and so I think that's why it was also playing around. But the little one is just full of beans. This is, that's awesome. <laughs> Donna, an interesting one. You say, is it true that zebra can be really aggressive towards humans? They can be incredibly aggressive towards each other, towards other species. And I'm afraid I've re I have read Donna. <laughs> He's looking very embarrassed now. Um, Donna, I have read that there are more zookeepers and zoo workers injured by zebras than there are by any other animal kept in a zoo. So yes, they can be quite nasty. And the other interesting thing about that, of course, is that they have never been domesticated fully. Yes, they've been the odd person who's raised them from foals and managed to sort of have a relatively decent relationship with them, but they were de never domesticated in Africa, and it's because they are not particularly friendly towards human beings. This is the best zebra sighting. Isn't it fantastic? So I don't think the zebras are having too, too much of a tough time from the drought. I've said that before. These guys look in very good nick indeed. And that's one of the reasons they'll be on the termite mound, of course, because the grass there is that much more nutritious. The termites have put their dung and their saliva and their fungus and 
gathered all the wood together, dragged it under the ground, and it's created a sort of really fertile compost. And that makes the grass on top of the mounds that much more tasty. So tasty, in fact, that little foal is unable to leave the grazing for long enough to go running. They are so horse-like, it's amazing. You saw how the other one snorted and the little one got a fright. And I saw a wonderful caption the other day on a picture of this massive horse. And the horse was looking with an expression of surprise into the lens. And the caption was, yes, I weigh 1,100 pounds, and yes, I'm afraid of a small plastic bag. And I get the same feeling from zebras. Is like the older one. Hmm. You know, while we just wait and see what happens with these zebras, some lovely information coming through on the crabs. And we've got three examples of three species. And so there really is a huge kind of difference in how long they live. A blue crab, apparently up to eight years. A um, hermit crab, and I'm sure there are lots of different species of hermit crabs, up to 70 years, 30 to 70 years. And then there was another species mentioned that lives around 10 years. So I think that we can certainly safely say, we can safely say that the crab in that hole, that freshwater crab, would live a good few years at least. And the horseshoe crab apparently also lives 20 years or more. So lots and lots of different crabs that live a long time. Marvellous, marvellous zebra sighting. Thank you. I think that precludes the need for me to do any kind of animal dance. Thank goodness. Don't you, Brian? Mm. Not required. Animal dancing. Right, we'll head towards some open areas now. I think we'll check in parlor planes and then we'll head towards quarantine clearings. And the reason for that, of course, a windy night like this, I th normally there would be some kind of activity on the clearings because the animals will come out onto them, the herbivores, the prey, because it's an easier way to see where the predators are coming from. A slightly disturbing rattle coming from the side of Rusty's left front tire. So if suddenly uh, we list to port, uh, it means that um, the tire has fallen off. Hear that, Brian? to get it looked at in the morning. Um, lovely question from Doug in Connecticut, and it's quite a common one, and it's an interesting one to answer. Um, Doug, you want to know about twins, and is it possible for zebra to have twins? Doug, as far as I'm aware, it is possible, yes. It is extremely uncommon, though. It's even possible with elephants, and I think it's possible with just about all animals out here. It's extremely unlikely, and it's uh, probably less likely than with human beings, and I think it's also less likely that there would be survival of both twins. I think you'd find more than likely one of them would die, one or both would die during the process of childbirth. Remember that with herbivores, the fetus is tremendously well developed by the time it's born. I was just hit in the face by a vicious insect. Um, tremendously well developed, and so the fetus is very large when it's born. And if you look at the animals that have multiple births, something like a rat, for example, or a rabbit, which is a wonderful example, they're born altricial, very small, 
and blind and often furless. All the predators have got babies like that, which means that they can give birth to more than one. It's not difficult for the mother to carry more than one fetus. But for those that are going to be precocial, so animals that are born able to run almost immediately, to have two fetuses of that size inside will almost certainly result in some kind of malformation probably or even death. So yes, it is possible, but it's highly unlikely that both would survive. And human beings, of course, lie somewhere in the middle. Our babies are completely altricial. You know, um, take, some of them take 40 years to become independent, but birth for human beings is not so much a function of the size of the baby, but the size of its head and this very narrow birth canal. So that's kind of a different story as to why, why well, it's why we have some twins, but not twins all the time. And Gabby, you want to know about what the dangers of being out here are. Gabby, um, I would say uh, it's an interesting one. We often get asked about danger and, you know, I think that there is a Oh, at night, Gabby, and the dangers of being out at night. Well, on foot, there are absolutely are dangers of being out at night, Gabby. If you want to be out at night, remember lions and hyenas and leopards and nocturnal predators are much more bold at night. They won't see us as any kind of a threat at night. And so if you see lions and hyenas and leopards on foot at night, they can be a lot more threatening to you. Then, of course, most obviously, to walk around here at night, if you can't see anything, you're going to surprise something. So a lot of the injuries that buffalo cause to people are at night in these camps, where you walk past a buffalo is quietly chewing the cud behind a, a bush or behind a building or something like that, and you walk into him and he gets a fight and he just charges. And that does happen every so often. So you need to walk with a torch at night. And as long as you do that, it's fine. Hippo, same story. They come out of the water at night time. You can't see. They don't see so well. And so if you walk into them, they can be quite dangerous. So those are the sorts of things. It's all got to do with the darkness and the fact that animals can't see. And therefore, they're much more likely to become threatened by a human presence. But Gabby, otherwise, no, not enormous dangers. As long as you're careful, we always insist that if people go out um, sort of outside the perimeters of the camp just to fetch something perhaps or you know lock the gate or something like that then they will have to take a torch and certainly in all the lodges none of the guests are allowed to move around at night without a security guard with a big bright torch just so that you can see what's going on thanks Gabby nice question as we go into the night next year, which is wonderful news. Thank you for doing that. Please come to South Africa. We can use all the tourists we can get, so that would be great. And you say you were reading up on the Kruger sightings, just to keep an, you know, abreast of what's going on. And I think you were talking about the open pack of dogs being 25 kilometers from Open Gate. Uh, I think that's, is that correct, Mickey? Is that, is that what was going on there? Right. And you want to know, is that possible? How big are their territories? They don't have territories, to, um, Tony. They have home ranges, and they can vary from 450 square kilometers, so that's 45,000 hectares. So that is 30 times the size of this land that we're driving on. 30 times, up to 1,000 square kilometers. So up to 100,000 hectares. So that's an enormous range. And sometimes they'll be, I mean, you've seen it. They've been in this area, they'll be here for kind of two or three days, maybe a week, maybe two weeks, and then they're gone. And they'll come back maybe two months later. So they move massive, massive distances. So when you say 25 to 30 kilometers from Open Gate, no, that doesn't surprise me at all. It's completely normal. And that's not exclusive home range. Remember, they don't mark territory in the same way that any of the other dogs do. Mm. 
Patricia, you say we haven't had any dog sightings in what feels like forever. No, we have. We, I mean, what, Brian, about a week? Two weeks, maybe? Two weeks, Patricia, I think we probably had the dogs last. And we had them for quite an extended run then. We had two packs here for a little while. So, I mean, they have been around. I know that it does feel like they've been gone for a long time, but we, they have been around. Um, and I, interestingly, the Investec pack, which is, uh, forms the mainstay of our dog viewing, are on, uh, they're in the Manuleti at the moment. They're just below Tinswalo Lodge, and they seem to have lost one of the pups. So it's 12 of them now. I think the three adults, and instead of the nine puppies, at least, um, what was it, 11 puppies, I think there are only, there are only 12 of them now. It used to be. It used to be 13 in the pack, didn't it? Three and, no, it was 14, it was three and 11. And I think it's now three and nine. That's quite interesting news on the Investec pack of dogs. I suppose I should bring myself, extend myself to shining the spotlight, except now I've just pulled out my communication, so I will not be able to hear anything that Nicola Austin says to me, which is an absolute disaster. Stand by. There we go, she's back. Yes, testing, testing, you're back, Nicola, fear not. Right, there we go, some zebra. So frolicking about. We're not going to shine a light on them. We'll just go gently past. So we're coming on to quarantine clearings now. And it is getting a bit breezy and cold now, isn't it, Brian? Yeah. How many jackets have you got? Only on? one still. Only one jacket. You must be freezing, Brian. Not at the moment. Oh. Very comfortable. Here come some impalas running along. There's no alarm calling. I'm just going to stop and listen. Yeah, you can see the shining eyes of the impala. They don't seem to be doing anything. Please, Eric, you've mentioned on the chat that a few of the pupils that were part of that uh, show that we did, uh, I've been watching in their spare time. That fills me with a great sense of joy. I'm very pleased, Eric, and I long may that last. We're just going to pop to the end of quarantine here, and if we don't come up with anything, we'll head across to Scott. Thank you very much, Miss Lynn. You say you tell everybody about Safari Live and everyone how to watch it, and yet you need to have a sandwich board sponsored for you. I'm going to speak to Graham Wallington this very night and insist that he sends you a sandwich board with all of our details on it so that you may walk the streets of North Carolina, all the highways and byways, and possibly, um, well, wherever else it is that you go, uh, with a sandwich board around your neck stating where you can watch live safaris and how. Right, on that note, uh, before I say something completely ridiculous, let's go across to Scott. We're at the end of quarantine clearings. I'm going to go past the Juma Dam and we'll see what's there. Well, a very big thank you to all of those who are spreading the word of Safari Live. It needs all the help it can get. And like I keep telling everyone, the more people that get involved, the more places you will be able to be taken on safaris. So. Thank you, and exciting future awaits all involved. I'm hoping, I'm in kind of snake mode at the moment. It's funny how you go through different modes of what you may be hoping to find. And at the moment, I'm in snake mode, specifically African rock python mode. Hi 
about it, Jim, in Ohio, you would like to know if there are plans for any more night drives. Yes, um, it certainly is the plan to be able to more effectively take people out after dark. But when exactly those plans and equipment required to pull, uh, to pull that off is going to be in place, I do not know. But that is definitely in the pipeline. But sadly, like I say, there's no set dates as to when you could be expecting to see or be involved in more night safaris, but it certainly is something to look forward to. Now, who asked for the frog? Was it Angie earlier? I think it was. We are getting close to where the gray tree frog was. And hopefully we'll be able to find it now. Apologi apologies, you were at work yesterday. Um, that's why you couldn't watch. I was only kidding though. We don't expect everyone to watch every single safari. Um, and I think work is probably the best excuse out there. But it was just on the left-hand side of the road, uh, a couple of hundred meters ahead of us. So we'll scan very carefully when we get to it. There's a fallen down knobthorn acacia that we spotted it in. It was quite easy to spot because it, 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 would, it had made its uh, color very white shade they can alter their skin color depending on what they are wanting to achieve and it was obviously trying to keep cool because it had made itself very white interestingly why well, i'm not sure because it wasn't the hottest of days so interesting but they're usually a more gray dark mottled color Hello, Dennis, in Spain, and good to hear from you again. I don't know where you've been hiding, but nice to know you're still out and about with us. You mentioned that I said uh, animals that have not experienced people in Africa, will, their default move will be to run away from them. But you are asking whether that would be the same for young children. Um, because you noticed in a zoo nearby or recently that a jaguar was fixated on the children but not the, the adults or a predator at least, maybe not a jaguar. Um, yes, um, I think children will be uh, uh, a more in inquisitive subject or a subject that will uh, induce a more inquisitive, curious outlook from predators as they are probably less threatening than us. Um, and that's, that's possibly the case out here as well, but when is a little kid gonna be either walking or driving through the bush? Never really. Um, so it's not really applicable um, in the wild. And I'd be careful also on that topic of, um, here's the tree where the frog was in. Um, I can't see it though, but I'm going to jump out and have a closer look around. Um, let me just scan around first. Um, it was sitting right on that little branch that I'm shining the lights on now, where there's a little kind of knob or node. Let me move forward. It was sitting yeah, right there. Um, right there yesterday. Oh. So, I'm not too sure where it's gone, Angie, but it was somewhere in this tree. Let me jump out and have a very quick look with my torch. Um, okay. Where have you gone to? 
It'll be so cool if we find it again. No joy. First glance. I'm hoping it would stick out. Oh, your mic's cutting out. Uh, you cannot hear me. Maybe you can only hear a little bit of what I'm saying. So I will come back. Hello. Okay, well, oh joy. See, yes, but like I was saying, Daniel, in Spain, um, I would be cautious of reading too much into a uh, captive wild, sorry, Dennis. Um, in Spain, I'd be cautious to read too much into behavior of wild animals in captivity and then apply that same behavior to uh, animals in the wild because naturally being in captivity is going to cause them to act uh, well strangely I don't know if that's the right, right word but not as they would in the wild Okay, well, it's that stage of the evening again, and it's time to start saying thank yous and goodbyes, and it has been great fun. I would firstly like to thank, on behalf of everyone involved, Viem for finding that leopard, a new leopard that all of us had never seen before. So. That is the first and most important thank you. The rest is obviously you guys for being there to see it. Nikki, Louise and Leanne in the final control. Thank you for helping us out. Oh, here's a baby chameleon. It's this tiny one. Um, I'm going to jump out. We got it there, Vim. Where did it go? Oh, there it is, top right. Now, to give you an idea of how small it is, I'm going to jump out quickly. It is minute. Um, oh, there goes my earpiece. Forgot to unplug it. It is tiny. Oops. I bobbled its little branch quite a bit. So that gives you an idea of just how small it is. Minute. So guys, thank you very much, and it's been great fun. I've really enjoyed being out with you on safari. I'm looking forward to tomorrow morning to try and work out where exactly these lions have gone. Um, hopefully they'll be in a more easy to spot position. Oh, my earpiece is broken. I ripped out completely. So I don't have any comms, but thank you very much for everything. We will see you all tomorrow. Over to James. Well, we found a chameleon too, everybody, so nyan, nyan, nyan. We didn't only find one chameleon, though, did we, Brian? No. What did we find? We found another one. There's another one. In the same tree. We think that's a chameleon. Might be a worm. No, it is one. Is it a chameleon? Oh, good. Cool. So, Scott has now told you all about these chameleons. They are the flapnick chameleon, of course, and they will be looking for insects in this thorn tree. They're probably feeling quite spiky, and they're probably holding on for dear life, hoping not to be blown off the tree. And it does make me wonder why they would have chosen a tree like this, but I suspect it's an acacia tree, and therefore will attract the attentions of ants, and I wonder if the young chameleons like this, you see they're very little ones, aren't quite partial to the odd ant meal, perhaps. Perhaps Polyrhynchus the ant with its beautiful lemon drop tasting abdomen. All right, let us continue. I was about to say that oh, Scott, of course, thanked the ant for finding the leopard. And I was about to say, well, Brian, shall I thank you for finding a wasp's nest? Because we did find a wasp's nest. And then he spotted those chameleons and redeemed himself entirely.
pop across the dam wall here. This will be our last act of the afternoon, Brian. Oh, oh good heavens. We just drove straight through a large puddle. It's so nice having puddles around, I have to say. It's been so long since we've had any. I think we'll just stop here and have a little listen before I say goodbye to you. In the background, a water thickney and a lot of wind, which is what I've given you all afternoon, a lot of wind. Thank you, Brian, for your Thank efforts you, today. Be your beautiful thumb, perhaps one more view. Marvellous. Thank you, Nicola and Leanne in the final control, and, of course, Scott and Viam on the other vehicle. So nice, as Scott said, that Viam found that beautiful leopard. We will see you tomorrow at 05.30. Please join us then, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Bye-bye.